Thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, thanks. It's nice to be back at PDF. It's been some years, and it's an honor. It's an honor to follow my colleague from EFF, uh, Danny O'Brien. As you can hear from his accent, he's the staffer who lives in America. And as you can hear from my accent, I'm the staffer who lives in England. Uh, <laughs> true. Um, I, I, I mentioned I live in England. I, there's actually a small formality I need to go through now as the last speaker of the day and as a member in good standing of the after dinner and conference speakers of England, Scotland, and Wales. I am required to make a joke about being the thing between you and the free drinks. <laughs> this is that joke. <laughs> so uh, we live in a world that is made out of computers. Uh, and while that's very exciting for sort of 14-year-old me who imagined that someday there might be computers everywhere. These days, it's not just looking like bad news, it's looking like actually terrible news because the Internet of Things is being born with the inkjet printer business model. The idea is that it comes broken out of the box, locked so that you can only use manufacturer-approved consumables and you can only add on manufacturer-approved services. They want to make sure that when you buy your parts, you buy your parts from them so that you pay the margins. They want to make sure that when you add software or other services or functionality to it, that you buy that software through their app stores so that they can take 30% of the hides of their software vendors. They want to make sure that you don't buy functionality that puts them in breach of some obligation they've made to a government. Our cars will never speed. Our thermostats will never let you turn them back up after they've been turned down by the power company. They want to make sure that they're locked against you. Um, it's digital rights management for stuff. And nobody wants this, right? Just as nobody woke up this morning and said, do you know what I really want? I want a service that lets me do less with my books, right? I want a way to do less with my music. Nobody ever woke up and said, I want a coffee machine that when I put a pod of my choosing in it says, I can't let you do that, Dave, right? <laughs> and when Keurig tried it, when Keurig put DRM in their stupid coffee machines, which don't, don't make very good coffee to begin with, but when they put that in their coffee machines, um, their sales dropped by 25% right, because the market rejected. And that's generally what happens with these digital logs. Markets don't solve all of our problems, but when you market things that are like manifestly broken out of the box, generally speaking, your competitors come along and fix them. Right? They, they add functionality back that you've taken away. So this is why we have third-party inkjet. Right? You can get your cartridges refilled, you can buy them from other people. And in normal markets, that's how this stuff gets solved. Companies that do bad things lose to companies <coughs> that do better things. But the market that we live in when it comes to stuff that's digital is anything but normal. And that's because in 1998, Congress passed a law called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. The US trade representatives scurried around the world and convinced governments all over the world to enact their own versions of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. In Canada, where I'm from, we passed ours in 2011, which is pretty embarrassing because making dumb mistakes about the internet in 1998 is one thing, but making <laughs> dumb mistakes about the internet in 2011, that's felony stupid. You know, as Aaron Swartz said, it's no longer okay not to understand the internet. So, the DMCA contains this, this clause that says that it's a crime punishable by up to five years in prison and a $500,000 fine to add legitimate legal features to devices if you have to jailbreak them to do it. If your device is locked so that you can't make it do something without breaking that lock, even if the thing you want to do is allowed, breaking that lock is against the law. And this is terrifying, and it's not just terrifying because it lets the companies charge us up the butt for coffee refills or inkjet refills or keep certain uh, features out of their devices or screw the independent software vendors who they put in their app stores. This is terrifying because the rules that protect this digital rights management stuff, whether it's in printers, whether it's in thermostats, or whether it's in your e-books, these rules prohibit disclosing information that could lead to a jailbreak. These are bugs flaws and vulnerabilities, mistakes that programmers made. Because once you know about a mistake that the programmer made in your device, you can crack that device open and you can get it to do what you want it to do. You can install your own firmware that does what you ask of it. But the bugs in your devices, they aren't just useful ways of defeating the programmer's intention to stop you from doing what you want. The bugs in your device are also ways that you can insert malware into devices, that you can trick them into doing things that act against your interests, that third parties 
can trick your devices into doing things that are against your interests. And when you start with a device that is designed to treat you as its adversary, to override your instructions, to hide what it does from you, and to, in every possible way, defend itself against you giving it orders, and then you add a prohibition on disclosure of vulnerabilities, then as soon as someone can figure out how to break into your device because it's a long live reservoir of digital pathogens, as soon as they figure out how to break into your device and start becoming resident in your device's operating system and doing things that hurt you, your device will do everything it can to stop you from finding out what's happening and to stop you from stopping it from happening. Crimeware, spyware, and malware get to run amok in this privileged mode. So what does it mean when we ban disclosure of defects? Well, we only have one experimental methodology to uh, find out about uh, whether or not our security systems work, uh, and that's disclosure. As, as Bruce Schneier says, security is a process and not a product, and the reasons for that go very far back in our history of uh, technology and, and, and philosophy and scientific thinking. So before we had contemporary science, we had a thing that looked a lot like science called alchemy. And alchemists did stuff that was a lot like what scientists did. They, they formulated hypotheses, and then they tested them out. Uh, but they didn't do one thing that scientists do. They, they didn't tell each other what they thought they'd learned. And as a result, they fell prey to the most uh, intractable of human frailties, which is our endless capacity for self-deception, right? To believe that your experiment told you what you thought it was going to tell you, and not what it's actually telling you. And as a result, every alchemist discovered for himself in the hardest way possible that drinking mercury was a bad idea, right? <laughs> we call that 500-year period the Dark Ages. And when alchemists started publishing, when they submitted themselves to adversarial peer review, that's where your friends tell you about the mistakes you've made and your enemies tell you what an idiot you were to have made them, when they submitted themselves to this, we call what they made science, and we call the moment at which they made it the Enlightenment. And the only way we can find out whether our security stuff works is to tell people about the flaws in it, the flaws that we think we've discovered in it, so that they can be fixed. Because anyone can design a security system that works against themselves, right? But unless you are the smartest person in the world, all you've done is designed a security system that works on people who are stupider than you. And so if we're going to have working security, it has to include disclosure. Now, I said we lived in a world made of computers, and I don't just mean the kind of futuristic world where we all dress like Tron extras uh, and, and walk around uh, in, in an Internet of Things promotional video. I mean, today, this world that we live in right now is a world in which the most dispositive factor about many of the things that we interact with all day, every day, in ways that are potentially lethal, those things are computers. So uh, take cars, right? The informatic systems in cars every year at conferences like DEF CON and CCC and Black Hat, security researchers show up and they show they can tunnel in through seemingly innocuous interfaces like the uh, musical interface for the Bluetooth speakers. They can tunnel in, compromise the informatics on the car, and take over to disable the steering and the brakes, right? The most important factor about your car is the computer that's inside of it. It's a, it's a computer that you put your body inside of and drive down the highway at 100 miles an hour. Um, uh, there are a million cars on the road today that were uh, uh, sold under a subprime loan. Uh, it's the newest way of, of securitizing poor people. You offer people who are poor credit risk subprime loans on their cars, and you create bonds backed on the returns from those loans. And the way that you make sure that those bonds are secure is you fit every one of those cars with a governor, a, a networked, uh, location-aware uh, uh, ignition override that enforces the terms of the, of the loan. So, you know, if you miss a payment, they had their own loudspeakers. If you miss a payment, it starts shouting at you, you are late on your payment, you are late on your payment, and it doesn't stop until you make your payment. Um, but more importantly is if you, after 30 days, or if they want to repo the car, or if you break the terms, like you drive across a county line and you've agreed to stay within the county, it just shuts your car off. And the cops, you know, they can use it as an ignition override, they can use it as an immobilizer to stop you. Uh, hackers who break into dealer computers have successfully immobilized every car the dealer's ever sold. Um, you can imagine that in the future, people who want to carjack you, who manage to find out how to impersonate a cop, will be able to make that car stop. The most important thing about that car is its informatics, too. And then many of you probably noticed in the last couple of months, there have been all these stories about John Deere and the Copyright Office, which is a pretty weird sentence. Um, 
uh, John Deere make the, the green tractors, and um, the Copyright Office every three years entertains exceptions to this rule about not, not being, you're not being allowed to jailbreak things. And um, one of the petitions was to allow people to jailbreak their cars, their tractors' informatics systems, because the tractor companies, along with the car companies, they lock the informatics in the car uh, so that only a mechanic who has an authorized unlocker can find out what's wrong with your car and service it. And to get authorization for that unlocker, you have to promise to buy official parts from John Deere or GM or whatever, and not third-party parts that might be cheaper and give you a better deal, might be better manufactured, whatever. And John Deere, in their answer to this, to this brief that, that was filed to make an exception to the DMCA, John Deere said, uh, no, you don't own your tractor. You can't own your tractor because you're only a licensor of the copyrighted software in it, and that copyrighted software is protected by a technical protection measure, and that is protected under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and you are a tenant, a tenant farmer of your tractor, and in case you had any doubts about it, GM filed a brief as well to say, yeah, that car in your driveway really is not your dad's Oldsmobile. I mean, literally, that's not your dad's Oldsmobile. It's still GM's Oldsmobile and will be for life plus 90 years. Um, planes. Planes are computers that we put our bodies into that fly through the sky. I, I flew here on a Boeing 747 from London, flying Sun Solaris workstation in a very fancy aluminum case. Right? You have to reboot the, jet the Dreamliner, the 787, every 284 day 48 days, or it literally crashes. Right? Uh, we're in New York. If you look on the skyline, if you're up on the 10th floor for the lunch breaks or whatever, you look at the skyline, you'll see these tall, willowy, impossible Stark Attack towers that have sprung up everywhere the finance industry has colonized things. These very, very, very narrow, tall towers that seem impossible. How could they possibly stay erect? Well, the way that they stay erect is through informatics. They have dynamic load adjustment that allows them to adjust their structural members to compensate for wind and seismic stresses. That building is a case mod you live in, and when you take the computers out of it, it falls down. Um, so I mentioned those Internet of Things videos before. If you've ever watched those Internet of Things videos where everyone looks like Tron, they walk into the house and they first they wave at their house, right, and the lights come on. <laughs> then they talk to their house, tea, black, hot, Earl Grey, and they walk into the kitchen and there it is. Well, what's the implication of living in a house where you can wave at it and talk to it no matter where you are? The implication is that that's a house where no matter where you are, you're on a camera and a microphone. And if that house is designed so that you're not allowed to know about security vulnerabilities in it, and if you do find out about them, you're not allowed to change out the software that's running on it, that house is a panopticon that makes George Orwell look like he belongs on Sesame Street. <laughs> so, thank you. So um, it's not just that we keep our bodies inside of computers. We increasingly put computers inside of our bodies. If you're like me and you grew up with the Walkman, or if you're a little younger and you grew up with the MP3 player, we're all logged enough punishing earbud and headphone hours that there will come a day when we're going to get hearing aids. And it's vanishingly unlikely that those hearing aids are going to be beige, retro, hipster, analog, transistorized hearing aids. They will be computers in our bodies. And depending on how they're configured, they'll either let us hear what's there or maybe they'll tell someone else what we're hearing, or maybe they'll make us hear things that aren't there or stop us from hearing things selectively. Um, uh, there's an amazing uh, uh, researcher that I'm very fond of, a guy at MIT who runs their prosthetics lab at the Media Lab. His name is Hugh Hare. He's got a great presentation. It's got pictures. I don't do pictures. I'm a words guy. And his pictures are all amazing computers that they've put into people's bodies, arms, legs, feet, hands, uh, even neural prostheses for treating otherwise untreatable depression. And his last slide is the killer because he clicks the button, and there he is on the slide in Gore-Tex, totally ripped, stuck to the side of a mountain like a gecko, and from the knees down, he's got prosthetics strapped to the stumps of his legs, except he's not on crutches, he's not in a wheelchair, he's been walking around the stage like this the whole time, and he goes, oh, didn't I mention, and rolls up his pants legs and shows you that attached to the stumps of his legs are two robotic legs. And he says, oh, yes, I lost my legs in a mountaineering accident, a frostbite, and he starts running around the stage and leaping like a mountain goat. It's a killer demo. And the first question anyone asked was, how much did your legs cost? And he named a price you could buy a brownstone in the village. The second price, the second question anyone asked is, who can afford those legs? And he said, why, of course, anyone, because if you're going to take a 60-year mortgage out on a house or a 60-year mortgage out on the legs, you'll take the legs. So start thinking about those subprime cars and people who don't own parts of their bodies, and what it means when the payday lender owns your legs and has an override that lets them repo them by making you walk to the repo office when <laughs> your legs aren't, um, 
uh, uh, when your legs aren't, aren't uh, in compliance with their rules. So Larry Lessig, take a drink, uh, taught, us <laughs> that, taught us that there are four factors that regulate our society, markets, code, law, and norms. And um, a e Electronic Frontier Foundation, whom I've gone back to work for after a 10-year hiatus while I was writing books, I'm still writing books, uh, EFF has launched this project with me called Apollo 1201. 1201 is the section of the DMCA that bans circumvention. The Apollo mission was a 10-year mission to uh, put a human being on the moon. Our Apollo mission is within 10 years, we're going to eliminate all the DRM in the world. Thank you. And we're going to do it with law, code, norms, and markets. So law, we're, we're, uh, we have clients and we're looking for clients who we think have a good chance of uh, getting sued and in the process of getting sued overturning uh, uh, section 1201 of the DMCA. After all, code is a form of expressive speech. That's something we established in 1992 when in the Bernstein case we defeated the NSA's ban on, on uh, publishing crypto by arguing that Daniel J. Bernstein, a mathematician at Berkeley, had the constitutional right to publish source code that embodied strong ciphers and since then we've had crypto, you're welcome. Um, and uh, uh, that law part is something we've got handled, but we need the rest of it, and that's where you guys come in. Uh, we need code, so we need uh, programmers who are doing interesting things in security research that involve jailbreaking stuff where you're worried about getting sued. If you're worried about getting sued, come talk to us, because we want to know about it, because we want to counsel you, and we want to figure out whether or not we can work together. Um, norms, right? We want you folks to start having this normative conversation with the people around you about the illegitimacy of solving our social problems by putting mandates on our technology. The idea that we can somehow make ourselves safe by prohibiting people from telling them how their computers work. Because as soon as you say, oh, well, software locks are a good way to solve your problem, then the FBI shows up and says, well, if that's the case, why don't we just ban strong crypto and we'll have this mandate that says you can only install software that we've approved that has a backdoor that we can use to spy on our adversaries. So we need to have this normative conversation. But the other piece that I want to talk to you about is markets. Because as this lawsuit gets, gets underway, as this is in, in train, there will be a long process, maybe a decade, while this works its way up to the highest courts in the land, during which um, the law is in play, right? Whether or not it's prohibited to, to, ban, to circumvent uh, an effective lock is something that will turn on how our lawsuit turns out. And in turn, our lawsuit will turn out on how many people break those locks while we're, while we're waiting for it. If you all start businesses, if you all make products that rely on our, on our lawsuit, and if we can show a judge that when there are products in the market that circumvent, society doesn't collapse and the ceiling doesn't fall and people don't stop uh, investing in technology, that helps us. It also helps us go abroad and talk to our partners around the world, like you just heard about the work we've done in Paraguay. It lets us go to our partners around the world whom the USTR has arm twisted into their own versions of the DMCA and say, you were supposed to have a suicide pact and they're mutual. And now that America's stopped paying attention to this, why don't you repeal your own version of 1201 so we can get rid of it everywhere in the world. We can harness markets to help us improve this legal and technical situation. So, when I describe this long 10-year plan that we've come up with that we're working on, people ask me if I'm optimistic or pessimistic about it. But, you know, primarily I'm a science fiction writer by trade. And asking a science fiction writer to predict the future is not a good idea because science fiction writers who make predictions about the future are like drug dealers who sample their own product. It never ends well. <laughs> Besides, if I was pessimistic about the future of technology, I would get up every morning and do everything I could to try to remediate those potential harms coming down the road. And if I was optimistic about technology, I would get up every morning and do exactly the same thing. So why does it matter? So, thank you. So rather than optimism or pessimism, I'm going to ask you to consider hope, which is a, 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 quite a time-worn word in this era, but one that I'm quite fond of nevertheless. Hope is why when your ship sinks in the sea, you tread water, even if you think that you'll probably not be picked up. Not because you're likely to be picked up, but because everyone who is picked up treaded water until help arrived. Um, and if you were with someone who couldn't kick for themselves, you would put their arms around your neck and kick twice as hard. And the people in this room are capable of understanding these dangers that are coming. You guys are, you folks are, are sort of ahead of the curve on this. And so it's our job to bring the rest of the people with us, to say we don't know how to solve the whole problem, but we know how to solve this piece of it. And when we solve that piece, maybe the next piece will suggest itself. So none of us are pure. 
none of us make great decisions all the time about our technology. We all of us get up every morning and we give money to phone companies that are destroying net neutrality. We give money to uh, technology companies that are petitioning to put programmers in jail for disclosing vulnerabilities. We all make decisions that end up redounding on us and our future. Uh, and I'm not going to ask you to be pure. I'm not going to ask you to only use free software and, and only surf through Tor and, only, uh, and, and turn on NoScript all the time, even if it breaks all your favorite websites. Instead, I'm going to ask you to hedge, to figure out how much money you spend every month on companies whose mandate is to destroy the future that we want to build, and figure out what percentage of that you're going to give to EFF and groups like EFF to keep the internet free and open. Thank you. Um, not because the most important issue in the world is a free, fair, and open internet. There are issues that are far more pressing than that. There are people gunned down in the streets because of the color of their skin. There are issues around gender and, and gender discrimination. There's climate change that's going to drown us all. Um, but because every one of those fights is going to be won or lost on the internet. And so the internet is also a necessary but insufficient precondition for everything that we want to make. So that's my pitch to you. Uh, uh, an internet of things that do what they're told, not an internet of things that come out of the box pre-pwned for script kitties and spies. And I hope you'll help me build that world. Thank you.